Nexa Music, truly inspiring. Hello and welcome to Nexa Music Season 2 podcast. My name is Nirmika Singh and today I have a very, very special guest, one of my favorite independent artists. We have somebody who's blazed a trail in indie music and if you love indie music, you probably followed her as part of Shire and Funk and as part of her iconic solo artistry. I'm talking about Monica Dogra. Welcome, Monica. Thank you. Thank <laughs> How's you. it been? It's so nice catching up today. It's been amazing. I've only been back in India for five weeks and I feel like so many things have happened. It's been a whirlwind and a beautiful one. Tell me everything about it. I know there's a song brewing, Fever mm -hmm. of Love. Mm -hmm. And you know, we're so looking forward to the video. You just shot the video. Tell me mm -hmm. everything about the song. Okay, so Fever of Love, of course, is an Exa music property. It's a collaboration between myself and Mikey McCleary, who is famously known as one of the hit makers in India. He's worked with probably Many of the songs that stick in your ear from the last decade have been in one way or another from true. Mikey. And so he's one of the first artists that I met and collaborated with when I came to India back in the days of Blue Frog. He was one of the residents there, one of the resident producers there. And we worked on a lot of ads and jingles together. So we came back together after many years for Fever of Love, which is a new disco track. Um, it's kind of, it's like silky and smooth and kicked back and very hooky and about what I think all of us know as that energy that comes purely from music, from the dance floor, from being with community where you don't need anything and you lose a sense of time and you lose even a sense of self and you just get so high. That is so, so true. Yeah, yeah. And you know when I first listened to the song, I was like, this is such a Monica Dogra song because a, it was, you can put a finger on what exactly what was happening overall in the song because it was disco, mm -hmm. it's pop, it's also, you know, very silky, mm -hmm. it's shape-shifting like mm -hmm. you and I think that your artistry has been so inspiring, Monica, just because you keep doing what you truly believe in, whether there are takers for it or not, right? Mm -hmm. You've been very brave and bold and I think that you have a voice which is very unique and Maybe because it comes so authentically from your creative self, it just makes sense. So it's always mm. made sense to you. And mm. I think that a lot of us are still, you know, still out of pace with that. You know, <laughs> we're still sort of keeping uh, pace with whatever you're up to. Is, is being futuristic or being ahead of your own creative self really been one of the drivers for you as an artist? I don't aim to be anything at all, actually. <laughs> That's, it's more for me, uh, art and creativity, storytelling more than anything, and storytelling through various mediums, through music, through, we were talking before we started this conversation about just the magic of a music video, for me, really brings in all of the things that I'm passionate about. Dance, music, storytelling, the medium of film and fashion. These are all things that I find really fascinating. Like the first time I saw you, I was like, oh, what are you wearing? For me, what you're wearing tells a story. There's, there's it tells me something about who you are. So for me, my seeking and who I am, which is subject to change day to day, moment to moment, comes through in my art. And whatever I'm processing usually is what ends up going into the video. And I'm, I guess the one thing about me maybe is that I don't think about whether or not people will like things. Mm. I don't think too much about you know, whether or not it's relevant or if this sound is what everybody wants, which I now actually as an adult feel like I want to collaborate with people who keep me on track because of course as an artist you want to be at least like received. You don't right, want to completely course. bounce off of someone like, what is this? It's so confusing. So that way working with someone like Mikey, his mastery really is making hits. And my mastery is, is kind of being authentic and I don't even know what my mastery is really. But I've been able to keep surprising myself and to keep surprising my audience, which has just kept me going, you know, over the years. Right. And, and I think it's been a beautiful journey, Monica, of uh, not just reinvention, maybe rediscoveries along the way. And yeah. you've 
experimented with everything, right? Your solo music, which has been so diverse and so uh, immersive. There's been, you know, stuff that you did with Shire and Funk, and of course, you all played as a duo with a band, and we've seen everything. And the performance, my gosh, I think I really miss those gigs. Mm. We need you back on stage with a big band, Monica. Mm. <laughs> I think yeah. some of our best memories, also because I feel your career, wow. Your career actually coincided, could well be the story of it, the, the evolution of Indian indie music mm. as we understand it in contemporary times. I, I think started no, in a rock yeah, band. Yeah. Started in a rock band when you came down to India. Mm. We had just started to launch our biggest music festival. Then the story of NH7 kind of coincided with your story and your you know, evolution. I think that has been, wow. And you have now in the past couple of years taken a seat back, you're still you're making music but in a different way and a different avatar. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, How has mm -hmm. that process been for you? Just looking mm. back on say 13, 14 years of... 15. 15 years of doing yeah. everything in music. Yeah. And acting. And acting. One of the things, you know, of course I am completely different from anyone else as we're all different from each other. But I remember Madonna famously gave this speech and she says one of the most radical things she's done is she just never went away. And I really loved that because, Aww. you know, when I, when I first came to India, I was 22. I had nothing. I lived on other people's couches and floors. I had no money. I had no idea what I was doing. And the, the one thing I especially didn't have was self-belief. So, and that's the hardest thing, really. The ones who feel like they deserve are usually the ones who get and in mm. the process of becoming teaching yourself that you deserve someone to listen you deserve someone to pay you you deserve that stage is actually the first step of the process because otherwise you can be a bathroom singer you can as you you write this beautiful poetry i'm sure you've written most of your life but that one pivotal moment when you're like no my voice matters and i should share this you know it doesn't just belong right somewhere else so for me, how I became is I found other people to believe in and I believed in them and I showed up for them. And that was Shire and Funk, you know, and I don't need to get into it, but like the patriarchy and misogyny of this business is pervasive also in the indie scene. Um, women not being seen as valid to stand on their own was especially a problem then. I'm talking about 2007, 2008, where an independent artist, often I was written off for just being like some chick who wore a sari blouse and shaked her ass on stage rather than being a legitimate artist. Um, or be, having people show up for my looks rather than my poetry or, or my music. Just silly things like, I guess, human nature when you don't understand something to want to cut it down into mm -hmm. something that, oh, this makes sense and I can minimize right. it and then also cut it in this way. And then when I started to stand on my own, I also became very sensitive to opening up space for other women and Absolutely. wanting to uplift, make safer spaces at bars and clubs. I mean, I just DJed in a bar in, at, in Bandra and Bandra is a very safe area of Mumbai and a drunk guy pushed me in a corner and like touched me. This shit is really annoying. It's like, as I also am in resistance now to indie because I'm the opposite of independent. I'm super dependent. I'm dependent on, in my come up, I was dependent on OML. I was dependent on um, Babelfish that did The Doers, Star World, the networks that believed in me. I was never independent. I was constantly uplifted by now Kuki or Nexa that actually the only way to shift culture is when collaborations across industry happen. When someone is ready to say, I have these things that you need, you have things that I need. So beautiful. And we're not independent, we're reliant on each other, we're building something that's the greater, that's greater than our individual abilities. That is so beautifully put. Thanks. So I have goosebumps still. Thanks. I had goosebumps actually <laughs> thrice in this. It's beautiful that you say this because we're all, of course, we depend on each other and we yeah. get by with a little help from our friends. Totally. And I feel that um, the reductive understanding that people might have of your music is, mm. I think it's amusing at best. And mm. I'm sure you laugh it off with like. You know, I, for me now, at least, again, to draw from another personality I love, which is Ellen DeGeneres. Oh. <laughs> she said something that really hit me. She was like, I don't listen to the good things because if I listen to the good things, I have to listen to the bad. So for me, neither people's approval nor their disapproval really matters anymore. 
I, as far as I can tell, after 15 years, I keep one-upping myself, and that's good enough for me. You know, as long as something's better than what I did before, that means it's progress over perfection, right? That means I'm progressing. I'm good with that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Done is better than perfect and progress over perfection yeah. any day. And I feel that with Nexa Music, we've been able to create a very beautiful ecosystem of synergies sure. and collaborations where you know, people with a dream really got the support that they needed. And you're saying that we all need allies, we all need yeah. accomplices, we all need people to believe in us and tell us that we are good enough. Mm -hmm. We're good enough to put our art out. Mm -hmm. We're good enough to, you know, be worthy of a collaboration mm -hmm. and be worthy of a dream, mm -hmm. right? I think, I think you acted on your dream and to be able to act on your dream takes a certain amount of bravery and audacity. And I think that the biggest thing that one can do to anybody is to inject some audacity in them. And I think Nexa Music does that in like these that. cute little ways, mm -hmm. um, you know, which is, of course, their conversations. We're always collaborating. The ecosystem of, you know, people who did enter the competition, mm -hmm. it's not a the winner takes it all strategy here mm -hmm. at all. It's about nurturing, curating, and supporting them. What has your, you know, experience been so far as, you know, one of the headliners on the property? Mm -hmm. I know you've been part of many talent hunts. And we don't see Nexa Music as a talent hunt, so it's mm. like very different from what has been done in the past. You've seen what's happened in the past. What does this mean to you to be part of this? For me, Nexa Music is one of those golden ticket opportunities. It's one of those things that all artists sort of dream of, actually, where infrastructure and support and uh, industry people who know what they're doing all come to lift up the creative spirit and that is a dream come true you know always actually the artistry that i've seen the music that's come out from this season i was involved two previous seasons as well is similar actually you can find parallels in the individual artist's story but also the story of what it means to become just to become to get bigger and bigger and Nexa Music is back and better than ever. The music coming out this year is better than all previous years. Um, the artists that have come through, the mentoring, it's all very powerful. Right. This vehicle is life altering for all those involved, including the headliners. Oh, absolutely. I'm not a Bollywood artist. None of, I don't think any of the other artists uh, who are headliners are Bollywood artists. And for me, for better or worse, this is still the exception, it's not the rule. Hmm. Where someone comes and says, hey, I see what you have, and I want to make something great with you, it doesn't happen as often as you would think. I think the, the beautiful empowerment that Nexa Music represents for people who choose to write and perform in English is path-breaking, you know, because sure. I think we've also been very complacent all these years in being very critical of the lack of opportunities for English language musicians. We're all armchair critics about, you know, tapping away at our keyboard saying, English music doesn't get the money, support sponsors, because it's such a niche audience. And here we have a platform that's giving you the inspiration, the wherewithal, the structure and the support. And I think that itself for a country like India is, which is so Bollywood obsessed, is mm. Beautiful. How how was your you know because I'm guessing you are bilingual, mm. but trilingual maybe. Mm, right? Trilingual. Trilingual. Yeah. yeah. But I do know that your the mainstay of your artistry linguistically has been English. And when you saw people like yourself back in 2006 being supported by Nexa Music, now mm. was it like coming full circle for you? Times they keep changing. We live in like a really kind of fast content world now. And in order to keep up and create something that's really gonna last, that somebody wants to watch in four years, that's more than a TikTok, it costs a lot of money. It costs a lot of money, it takes a lot of time. You need a lot of support. So yeah, it's almost like finally there's a system that honors what it takes to survive in the business, but not only honors it, celebrates it and creates a vehicle where we also get a chance to give back to other right. to the future right. which for me is a huge huge wave and desire in my being is working with the youth working with people who are who are getting started and just giving them whatever i know because what's the point of going through life if not to do that for someone right. so it can be a little bit easier for them you know right you know if 
one word to look back on your journey and the big milestones that you have achieved and pick out say three things that you think are still relevant for every creative person to keep in mind given that people's attention spans today on social media are you know shorter than ever and we are in a space of fast content what are the three things that they should never ever stop you know believing in mm. i think that every artist no matter what medium there's a there's a seed within you of why you do what you do right if you're a photographer if you write poetry if you dance there's something there's a reason why and more often than not it's the feeling that thing gives you mm. and then i often talk about when i mentor people that there is i call it a tiny it's like it's super intense what i call it but there's a little bit of a fall from grace when you get paid to do the thing you love there are deadlines it, basically when you commodify anything something is at risk of getting lost if you're not mindful right is that authenticity it's not authenticity it's that love gets lost so it's like oh. oh day i have to wake up at 5 i have to do this it's not i want to i have to write this song i have to have to takes joy out of the experience and it's that joy that's actually why you do what you do in the first place So protecting that like it's the most it's like the most delicate porcelain thing in your being if you can protect that you will survive any storm any rise any fall in your career and you'll always keep going because whether or not someone hires you whether or not someone likes it you always have that thing that's you know what it makes me feel really good when i do this so chuck it if they don't like it chuck it if no one bought it I remember that when I was 6 years old and my parents fought I would sing this song in my bedroom and it made me feel free and with that energy I'm still singing at 35 and 55 and 65 that same energy lives in me no matter how many records I've written no matter how many people have approved or disapproved I live for that energy everybody else can go in the dustbin <laughs> <laughs> this is be you phenomenal know? more power yeah. to you i know that there was this has been your story and i think that yeah. this is the story that you would like to pass on to people who might be in similar dilemmas and conflicts in their mind um what are the moments monica that you feel that your creativity or your endurance as an artist is tested hmm. are those moments of you know say deadlines or when you install more stakeholders to your art yeah I mean you just answered it in a way. <laughs> It's like the more cooks that enter the kitchen, the more you can feel obstacle in the creative process. But I guess wisdom tells you that and also existence has proven that you know, we evolve like just talk science. I am shifted by your presence. by the process of your witness i change hmm. so it's a weird i always say the divine lives in irony like everything's like yes this but also that like yes it matters that someone else is involved in helping you grow and it's also very important to not give a shit about what anybody thinks about you okay. so it's like both but i always say that usually and i this happened with mikey he and i had a lot of creative differences and what i loved about him and what you'll often hear about any great artist is there's always let's keep pushing until we find that third thing and that third thing that we're both happy with and that right. third thing that we're both happy with is better than what you think is best and what i think is best especially if we've entered into this contract where we're doing this together right it's, that's the contract right. you know we agreed so now that means we got to keep you know taking things off and trying things until we find that third thing it happened with kuki it happened with nexa it's not all a smooth ride like you know i'm also a very hands on artist you know i don't stop until i really feel like we've gotten at least the best we can possibly get you know even on set it's like everyone was so prepared and everything was going beautifully but if i notice i kept telling everyone don't think i'm unhappy it's just when i'm here it's my job to see what can be better so it's not that i'm i'm like critical i'm I just know. or or a diva or a bitch or whatever labels people especially love to give women 
who assert their power. I'll run myself until I get what I know is the best we can do. And there's no such thing as the best, but the best that what's possible between our collective abilities. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm so glad that you articulated that and so eloquently because um, you're responsible for your art and you're beholden to it and you love it and it's a part of your being. It's almost as if you're giving a part of your being to the world. I find that amusing when people want you to completely, you know, remove yourself from the system or to extricate yourself from like the process of creation, even the set right now, right? We feel so attached to it and I really feel that I have a stakeholder sentiment with every creative system that I'm in. So Monica, you also co-wrote The Fever of Love with Mikey. How mm -hmm. was that process like? Writing with Mikey is incredible. He's such a powerful voice. He's so, he's really quick. He's super yeah. sharp. And he has all these things that I don't have, which makes, again, I, I often say this, it's like the, the kryptonite is also the superpower. You know? <laughs> right. So creative differences. I don't have an ear that focuses on hooks and what people, what audiences mm. will grab onto. And Mikey really has that. Like Fever of Love, for example, was it took us a long time to find Fever of Love. Music is our drug. It was, was initially the hook line, and I didn't feel like that was the message that I wanted to send. And also, I have a sensitivity to it that maybe Mikey doesn't have, because I've worked in club culture for a really long time. And with all transparency, a lot of my seniors and my elders and people who influenced me, after using drugs and alcohol for so many years, they have liver issues, they have depression, and I went sober eight years ago, and I've relapsed a few times. But it's very challenging when you work in nightlife to kind of like strip away this um, amalgamation of substance abuse and alcoholism that's cool and hip right. and contemporary. Right. And for me, what's hip and cool and contemporary are people who own themselves, oh. make space, um, protect each other, uh, you know, that I celebrate the differences in your creativity versus mine and I protect your right to express yourself the way you want to express yourself. And for me, actually, the disco era, as much as, of course, it was influenced by uh, alcohol and drugs, it was also a time where, you know, AIDS was on the rise, uh, queer activism was finally being birthed, and disco was the space where people chose to support one another's individuality. Mm. It was a sound that meant that. So for me, I wanted to find a way to take the focus off of drugs or, or like a substance, which of course music is our drug, and that was Mikey's uh, intention and truth, is that you don't need anything, you just need music. Right. But I wanted the focus to actually be love and unification. And that feeling that you get when love is just pulsing through your entire being. It's feverish, it gives you goosebumps. Um, so that was, that was the process there. And when, I've, when we found Fever of Love together, both Mikey and I were like, cool, that's it. Maybe it's fever, the word fever. It just gives yeah. you a sense of, I mean, I'm already grooving when I hear fever. Yeah. It's also such a visual word. I don't know if you think of it like that. It's like fever. It just feels a little more, I don't know, there's like yeah, has chunks like, of musicality in the word itself. Yeah, it evokes like a feeling. And what I also loved about working with Mikey is before he started working on the track, because I was at my cousin's wedding and stuff, and we had written another song that didn't make it its way, which I hope we do something with. Um, <laughs> He asked me to send him a bunch of my poetry. Ah. And then based on my poetry, he took words that really inspired him or moments in my poetry that inspired him. And I wrote something about goosebumps. Uh, what happens when you fall in love and what happens when, yeah, when you're in rapture, basically. And he was like, I love that word, goosebumps. So then from there, we started to write ah. the track. Yeah. That's interesting. And I know that visually, I mean, as you're telling me about the whole idea behind the song and the words in it, Tell me about the video you just shot for the video. Yeah, okay, so the video is directed by this really inspiring, super cutting edge director named Lendrick Kumar. <laughs> uh, not to be confused with Kendrick Lamar. Um, but he's just so fascinating. He's got a, a very weird and wonderful 
mind, which is my favorite combination, weird and wonderful. And also very, he's super edgy. So he collaborated with, brought in a dance company called The Music Hub. And man, when I saw these dancers, I was so blown away. Oh. And I have a deep karma with dancers in general. I love dance. I used to dance myself for many, many years. I still dance, but I dance for my music. And yeah, this crew is phenomenal. They choreographed a really epic piece. Um, it kind of talks about bending time, uh, also creating our reality, and does it in a really visual and fun and provocative, edgy, disco, sparkly way. Oh, I love it. Yeah. I love the sound of all of that. Interesting. I can't wait to yeah. watch it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, when we think about your artistry, those are some of the words that come to mind, you know, because you've been all of those things, a bit of this, a bit of that. Mm -hmm. And I think with every project that you've done along the way, you've kind of presented a more immersive version of each of those things, mm -hmm. which makes you so unique. And I know that uniqueness cannot be, cannot be injected into another person. You cannot, but you can cultivate a culture of excellence and you mm -hmm. can cultivate a culture of originality and authenticity. When you work with young people and with, you know, budding musicians, how do you ensure that they learn these tenets of originality? That's a great question. I don't know if I've ensured that anyone's learned anything. I wish, I hope I have. Um, I often wonder about this question myself. How yeah. can I do that for maybe journalists, for curators? How can I get them to be as curious as I am? But I think I can only do it by being this curious myself. Yeah, you totally just hit it. <laughs> you know, as you're speaking, I was thinking about, you know, the concept of the wounded healer in general is like mm -hmm. what what's hurt me is the thing that I've I want to make sure doesn't happen to someone else or the thing that I wished I had I want to create for mm. other people so I started a, a female fronted festival it's an all-female lineup festival mm. um, called Revel Silk I've only done it once it's a day festival I only did it in LA, but I'm going to bring it to India. And why? Because I've had to fight so hard for that seat at the table. I was the like the one girl hmm. in so many things oh, for right. so long. Of course. That now I want men to experience what it feels like to be the only man in the room. Like, how does it feel? You know, feels good. Feels good. You know, so right. that because there's something about being othered. So yeah, my answer is yes, I try to lead by example. I try to become loving and compassionate and space making for other artists. And I also aim to be for myself, relentless, always learning, always getting better and committed to, yeah, committed to my craft. Beautiful. Uh, do you still face those hurdles from people? Are they still otherizing you when they're interacting with you? Are you still, this? is there a lot of tokenism still in music? Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Tell me more. Okay. I, um, you always have to wonder how honest you should be. <laughs> <laughs> I love this moment yeah. of reflection because, yeah. yeah, let me measure my words, but then I'm going to be as honest. Yeah, I think yeah. this is a safe space and I think we're also working with people who are going to have careers yeah. where we want them to be aware of these things and not paint a picture that's not accurate. Yeah. Yeah. I learned a very hard lesson once, and I'll start, I'll, I'll start this with humility. Number one, I know nothing at all. I'm still learning. Number two, I've always had a lot of opinions, and for whatever reason, because I've always fought my whole life, I came from a complicated family. I've been working since I was 15. I'm a fighter, so I'll fight. I'll fight you if I have to. Learning not to fight has been a really big lesson hmm. that actually it's better if I ask for help, if I, if I bow my head and I say, hey, teach me. There were points in my career where I've been to award ceremonies and watched artists lip sync and called them out publicly and then been banned from big award ceremonies for many years and really felt that like, oh gosh, at one point I was on those red carpets and now they won't touch me because I pissed off the CEOs of this or that. And I finally asked for audience. I asked 
to apologize because my career was suffering for how loud and vocal I was. And I learned a lot in that, in that one meeting where he was like, what you don't understand, Monica, is that we have this much time to film something. If something goes wrong, it all gets broadcasted live on TV to billions of people. We can't afford those mistakes. We can't control whether or not the artists show up having rehearsed and done their job, not drunk, not on drugs, whatever it is. So this is the only way. Right. I didn't know that. Right. I, was, I was sitting there like, you know, how can you make artists lip sync and like use hydraulics and air guitar? Like people can really play guitar. I was say, saying this, which is also true, but there are two sides to mm. every story. And that's what I mean by there's always a third that's better than what I individually think right. and what they individually think. Right. In a collaboration and a contract, there's a third thing where both parties learn and you get the best possible scenario. So as far as tokenism goes, there, I'm going to circle back to that, is that what is buyable, what people are buying is, um, can be broken down into graphs. This works, this doesn't mm. work. This sells, this doesn't sell. And the ones who often come with the money to fund the thing are answerable to numbers, answerable to money to like making back the investment essentially. And now I have a lot more compassion for that than mm. I used to have. Um, but yes, so what I mean to say is that industry standards change and in accordance to that, what gets produced changes. It's a symbiosis. Right. It has to go hand in hand. Now we have conversations around, you know, dark skin, uh, body positivity, um, feminism is on the rise, but for sure there's always so much more work to be done, Correct. you know? So that way I think I've always, oddly enough, been, because I am so shape-shifting, as you say, I can tick certain boxes, like I can be sexy, I can also be weird, I'm an actor, I'm also, I, I'm a writer, I can speak, I can do all these things, so if someone wants to tick a box, often you can take a piece of me and fit it in that box. That's how, and I can feel it when that happens. I know, and then my job is, once I'm welcomed into that box, so to speak, is to try and break it as much as I can. Right, you know, a lot of people who have the array of skills that you have are all often conflicted about which part should they identify as a strength and play to that strength. Right. And I think a lot of, I think brave, audacious ones are able to juggle and shift between all of those roles, which I think you do, but has there been a time when you've really, where, where, where an identity crisis has gripped you and you've grappled with it for a very long duration and yeah. it's affected you, yeah? yeah, yeah like yeah. because you are inherently many things, yeah. but then the industry demands of you to be that one great thing. If you're an actor, just stay an actor and just show yeah. me your actor self for at least five years and I'll yeah, that's not really been my struggle so much as uh, I think just what it means to be a woman and so kind of boxed in by your form. Right. Okay. That's always been a little bit of a like, oh my gosh, how much to use it, how not to use it. When does it become an opportunity versus a cage? And I find it in acting, I find it in music, it's in TV, it's on Instagram, it's like there was a time where now we live in the age of the influencer. If I post in my bikini every day, I'll have like at least 50 times more likes, likes and views and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, Mira and I are once said I, w I attended this really beautiful workshop with all these incredible artists who have shifted culture in profound ways. And she said something that stuck with me. She said, as an artist, you have to decide day to day how much you're willing to dance with the devil. Mm. And that changes based on your need also. Like, I stopped in the last few years because I just didn't feel like it, mm. you know? But yeah, being sexy and having other people take a call on what is sexy constantly in everything that I do is uh, men don't go through that, for sure. And definitely not all female artists go through that. Right. But I do. Right. On the upside, what are the things that are glorious and amazing and incredible right now that weren't probably existing when you started out? 
Well, in the same breath, that's what I mean. It's like, I think that what is sexy and what's celebrated has shifted so much. Right. And the fact that I'm still here and I can do all these things is like, it's a dream come true. I want to change everything, but I also would change nothing. It's like, we're in process here. <laughs> we're all, we're doing this together. We're figuring it out. Nobody knows what the hell is going on. The people who have who are answerable to the numbers and the financial investment, they do their thing and I'll come in like the shit disturber I am and be like, no, there's a better <laughs> way, you know? And as long as at the end of the day, we're smiling at each other and giving each other the hugs and we're like, hell yeah, we did it. I would say it's beautiful to see um, the voices finally being heard around uh, around body positivity, around that there's so much more open in the digital space. So actors who once never got a chance are, are acting, which means storytelling is now diversified. Um, people's access has shifted. So the ear of like the Indian ear has been exposed to dance hall and reggae and big room house. And because of TikTok, you know, songs suddenly go viral. It's it's a very it's a different world where anything can happen at any time and there's really no formula. I know. You know? It's also fascinating what a big ball of paradoxes and I know you yeah. are. Yeah. And I love it because that's what we always are, right? Like, as, especially if you're creative and if you're uh, doing stuff which is irreverent and authentic at the same time. On that note, Monica, I do want you to speak to our um, budding musicians, a lot of people look up to you for your artistry and what you represent, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think a lot of them also identify you as the sole sort of trailblazer when it comes to independent or dependent women artists. We don't mm -hmm. have many women artists who've been able, or maybe they've struggled with things that you probably did not have to that came naturally to you, right? Being mm -hmm. brave about your art and sticking to, you know, your sense of um, uh, uniqueness and authenticity. Uh, I mean, I'm sure all of us go through those internal battles, but the fact that, you know, you did, done was always better than perfect for you. Mm. I think that goes a long way. Mm. Um, so the power of consistency, the power of contentment in the, you know, the art that you're making. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of people would love to hear from you. I mentioned it earlier in this interview, which is that there's a reason why you do what you do and you have to preserve that thing and that'll keep you going through the sands of time. So that's that's the biggest lesson I would give young and budding artists. And then the second lesson too is that often uh, I hear from young people that they're waiting for some sort of big break mm. and there's no such thing. You know, there are a lot of small efforts and a lot of ego breaking that lead you somewhere. And often when you're in it, you're too wrapped up in the next thing to even enjoy it or know, you know this already. It's, and you, you have to fall in love with that process almost. It's like, what next, what next, what next? And do it for yourself, you know? Someone's not gonna come and hand you some contract with a 360 deal and even if they do, they might develop you and put something out and it'll be here and it'll be there and gone tomorrow because it's not based on your mm -hmm. reality or your soul mm -hmm. and you hear of that all the time. If you're interested in doing that though, you can always go the route of like playback singing, which is beautiful in its own way. Um, everything has its own balance of lights and shadows. And for sure, if you wanna create something that's yours, that's you, you've written it, you're the artist, you're known for what it is. And I've seen you go through all of the, and now that I'm looking at you, I've seen you go through all of these moments of re reinvention. Moments where you feel like, okay, I've made it. And trust me, it's like a season, it's gone. And you have to be in the next season. And sometimes that season's winter and everything's frozen and dead. But you have to trust that, you know, spring's gonna come and something else is gonna grow. It's all about that. So don't wait for a big break. Don't wait for somebody else to give you value. Give it to yourself and understand that it's something that's endless. It's like the ocean, it never stops. It'll keep coming and going. I love it. I love all that you've said. And I also believe that the biggest, um, the biggest sort of fuel for you has to be your own drive to want to create. It cannot be handed down to you. It cannot be injected by someone. It cannot be imparted. It cannot be learned. Mm -mm. You can learn by example maybe, but you really cannot give yourself the drive if you don't have it. So the why, you know, no, as, I'm just as Simon Sinek says, right? Like start with why. I think with 
everything you got to start with why totally. which is which also brings us to this um, beautiful sort of resolution with Nexa Music as well that Nexa Music's giving you this beautiful platform it's a jump start maybe not a foot in the door but we're kicking the door open for you however this doesn't stop here your journey's only just begun mm -hmm. and it's upon you and it's up to you to make the most of it mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. that is it that's it i mean nexa music is like i said it's one of those golden ticket opportunities it's a dream come true in terms of values it's so aligned and it really does that thing that every artist waits for which is brings together different aspects of industry i feel like i've just started i don't ever really look back and think like oh wow yeah amazing i did that i'm done now no it's always what's next what's next what's next so Nexa music as a property also, I'm seeing it grow. So who knows what next year? I hope I'm around next year. <laughs> of course um, you would be. But who knows what will happen next year. Right. And yeah, I, I just can't wait to see what the future holds with the property and also with my music video coming out next Yay! year. Yay! Woohoo! So, yeah. More power to you, Monica. And you. continue being the explorer, the inventor, and the genius that you are. Thank you. You I, as well. You as well. Yeah? yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. It mm -hmm. means a lot. I truly believe that because you've made all your tiny and big dreams come true, the ones that are yet to come will also come true. And we're all behind you mm -hmm. and we love what you do and thank continue being the leader that you are. Thanks. And thank you for doing what you're doing. Thank, thank you for your art. This you. is Nexa Music Season 2 Podcast. My name is Nirmika Singh. You're watching this on Rolling Stone India exclusively. And with me was Monica Dogra. Thank you.